the two negations of sri aurobindo ghosh as mentioned in his book the life divine today we learn of the first negation the materialist denial he starts with a quote from taittiriya upanishad he energized conscious force in the austerity of thought and came to the knowledge that matter is the brahman for from matter all existences are born born by matter they increase and enter into matter in their passing hands then he went into uh, then he went to varuna his father and said lord teach me of the brahman but he said to him energize again the conscious energy in thee for the energy is brahman the formation of a divine life upon earth and an immortal sense in mortal existence can have no base unless we recognize not only eternal spirit as the inhabitant of this bodily diamond uh, of this bodily mansion the wearer of this mutable robe but accept matter of which it is made as a fit and noble material out of which he weaves constantly his garbs builds recurrently the unending series of his mansions what a great sen- uh, sentence and let's read this again the affirmation of a divine life upon earth and an immortal sense in mortal existence can have no base unless we recognize not only eternal spirit as the inhabitant of this bodily mansion the wearer of this mutable robe but accept matter of which it is made as a fit and noble material out of which he meaning capital h e of he weaves constantly his garbs builds recurrently the unending series of his mansions nor is this even enough to guard us against a recoil from life in the body unless with the upanishads receiving behind their appearances the identity in essence of these two extreme terms of existence we are able to say in the very language of those ancient writings matter also is brahman and to give its full value to the vigorous figure by which the physical universe is described as the external body of the divine being nor so far divided apparently are these two ex- extreme terms is that is that identification con- con- is that identification convincing to the rational intellect if we refuse to recognize a series of ascending terms like life mind supermind and the grades that link mind to supermind so recognize a series of ascending terms between spirit and matter otherwise the two must appear as irreconcilable uh, otherwise the two must appear as irreconcilable opponents bound together in an unhappy wedlock and their divorce the one reasonable solution to identify them to represent each in the terms of the other becomes an artificial creation of thought opposed to the logic of facts and possible only by an irrational mysticism <laughs> if we assert only pure spirit and a mechanical unintelligent substance or energy calling one god or soul and the other nature the inevitable and end will be that we shall either deny god or else turn from nature which incidentally we are doing both right now <laughs> we are we are turning away from god and we we are turning uh, turning away from nature for both thought and life a choice then becomes imperative thought comes to deny the one as an illusion of the imagination or the other as an illusion of the senses uh, life comes to fix on the imat- life comes to fix on the immaterial and flee from itself in a disgust or a self forgetting ecstasy or else to deny its own immortality and take its orientation away from god and towards the animal purusha and prakriti the passively luminous soul of the sankhyas and their mechanically active energy have nothing in common not even their opposite modes of inertia their antimony their antinomies can only be resolved by the cessation of the inertly driven activity into the immutable repose upon which it has been casting in vain the sterile procession of its images shankara's worldless <coughs> sorry shankara's wordless inactive self and his maya of many names and forms are equally disparate and irreconcilable entities their rigid antagonism can terminate only by the dissolution of the multitudinous illusion into the sole truth of an eternal silence the materialist has an has an easier field the materialist has an easier field it is possible for him by denying spirit to arrive at a more readily convincing simplicity of statement a real monism the monism of matter or else of force 
but in but in this rigidity of statement it is impossible for him to persist permanently he too ends by positing an unknowable as inert as remote from the known universe as the passive purusha or the silent atman it serves no purpose but to put off by a vague concession the inexorable demands of thought or to stand as an excuse for refusing to extend the limits of inquiry therefore in these barren contradictions the human mind cannot rest satisfied it must seek always a complete affirmation it can find it only by a luminous reconcil- reconciliation to reach that reconciliation it must traverse the degrees which our inner consciousness imposes on us and whether by objective method of analysis applied to life and mind as to matter or by subjective synthesis and illumination arrive at the repose of the ultimate unity without denying the energy of the expressive multiplicity only in such a complete and catholic affirmation can all the multiform and apparently contradictory data of existence be harmonized and mani- and the manifold conflicting forces which govern our thought and life discover the central truth which they are here to symbolize and variously fulfill then only can our thought capital letter thought then only can our thought having attained a true center ceasing to wander in circles work like the brahman of the upanishad fixed and stable even in its play and its worldwide co- coursing and our life knowing its aim serve it with a serene and settled joy and light as well as with a rhythmically discursive energy but when that rhythm has once been disturbed it is necessary and helpful that man should test separately in their extreme assertion each of the two great opposites it is the mind's natural way of returning more perfectly to the affirmation it has lost it is ma- it is the mind's natural way of returning more perfectly to the affirmation it has lost on the road it may attempt to rest in the intervening degrees reducing all things into the terms of an original life energy or of sensation or of ideas but these exclusive solutions have always an air of unreality they may satisfy for a time the logical reason which deals only with pure ideas but they cannot satisfy the mind's sense of actuality for the mind knows that there is something behind itself which is not the idea the capital letter idea i idea with a capital a capital i for the mind knows that there is something behind itself which is not the idea it knows on the other hand that there is something within itself which is more than the vital breath either spirit or matter can give it for a time some sense of ultimate reality not so any of the principles that intervene it must therefore go to the two extremes before it can return fruitfully upon the whole it must therefore go to the two extremes before it can return fruitfully upon the whole for by its very nature served by a sense that can perceive with distinctness only the parts of existence and by a speech that also can achieve distinctness distinctiveness only when it carefully divides and limits the intellect is driven having before it this multiplicity of elemental principles to seek unity by reducing all ruthlessly to the terms of one it attempts practically in order to assert this one to get rid of the others this one to get rid of the others to perceive the real source of their identity without its ex- to perceive the real source of their identity without their exclusive process it must either have overleaped itself or must have completed the circuit only to find that all equally that all equally reduce themselves to that which escapes definition or description and is yet not only real but attainable by whatever road we may travel that is always the end at which we arrive and we can only escape it by refusing to complete the journey that is always the end at which we arrive and we can only escape it by refusing to complete the journey it is therefore of good augury a u g u r y it is therefore of good augury that after many experiments and verbal solutions we should now find ourselves standing today in the presence of the two that have alone borne for long the most rigorous tests of experience the two extremes and that at the end of the experience both should have come to a result which the universal instinct in mankind that veiled judge sentinel and representative of the universal spirit of truth refuses to accept as right or as satisfying in europe and in india respectively the negation of the materialist and the refusal of the ascetic have sought to assert themselves as the sole truth and to dominate the conception of life
in india if the result has been a great heaping up of heaping of the heaping up of the treasures of the spirit or of some of them it has also been a great bankruptcy of life in europe the fullness of riches okay this is a very important section i have to read this again in europe and in india respectively the negation of the materialist and the refusal of the ascetic have sought to assert themselves as the sole truth and to dominate the conception of life so he is saying europeans have negated uh, negation of the materialist and the refusal of the ascetic they have negation they have negated the materialist and the refusal of the ascetic have sought to assert themselves as the sole truth and to dominate the conception of life the negation of the materialist in india if the result has been a great heaping up of the treasures of the spirit or of some of them it has also been a great bankruptcy of life in europe the fullness of riches and the triumphant mastery of this world's powers and positions have progressed towards an equal bankruptcy in the things of the spirit nor has the intellect which sought the solution of all problems in the one term of matter found satisfaction in the answer that it has received therefore the time grows ripe and the tendency of the world moves towards a new and comprehensive affirmation in thought and in and in inner and outer experience and to its corollary a new and rich self fulfillment in an integral human existence for the individual and for the race a new and rich self fulfillment in an, in an integral human existence for the individual and for the race from the difference in the relations of spirit and matter to the unknowable unknowable with a capital u <clears throat> from the difference in the relations of spirit and matter to the unknowable which they both represent there arises also a difference of effectiveness in the material and the spiritual negations the denial of the materialist although more insistent and immediately successful more facile in its appeal to the generality generality of mankind is yet less enduring less effectively less effective finally than the absorbing and perilous refusal of the ascetic for it carries within within itself its own cure its most powerful element is the agnosticism which admitting admitting the unknowable behind all manifestation extends the limits of the unknowable until it comprehends all that is merely unknown its premise is that the physical senses are our sole means of knowledge and that reason therefore even in its most extended and vigorous flights cannot escape beyond their domain it must deal always and solely with the facts which they provide or suggest and the suggestions themselves must always be kept tied to their origins we cannot go beyond we cannot use them as a bridge leading us into a domain where more powerful and less limited faculties come into play and another kind of inquiry has to be instituted so here his argument is that the dependency of uh, western science on on whatever you can sense with your six sense organs six kinds of sentences the entire dependency is is on just those six senses uh five senses i mean uh so uh, and even so that that those five ends five senses uh are 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 the root of their knowledge and even reason is getting tied up with those five senses five senses which according to arvind ghosh is very limited and you should not bet all your money on just those five senses a premise so arbitrary <laughs> he calls this premise arbitrary a premise so arbitrary pronounces on itself its own sentence of insufficiency it can only be maintained by ignoring or explaining away all that vast field of evidence and experience which contradicts it denying or disparaging noble and useful faculties active consciously or obscurely or at worst at worst latent in all human beings and refusing to investigate superphysical phenomena except as manifested in relation to matter and its movements and conceived as a subordinate activity of material forces so he's saying anything that is not understood by them is considered considered subordinate to them subordinate to their materialistic world view as soon as we begin to investigate the operations of mind and of supermind in themselves and without the prejudgment that is determined from the beginning to see beginning to see in them only a subordinate term of matter we come into contact with a mass of phenomena which escape entirely from the rigid hold the limiting dogmatism of the materialist formula and the moment we recognize as our enlarging experience compels us to recognize okay and the moment we recognize as our enlarging experience compels us to recognize 
that there are in there are in the universe no there that there are in the universe knowable realities beyond the range of the senses and in man powers and faculties which determine rather than are determined by the material slogans through which they hold themselves in touch with the world of the senses that outer shell of our true and complete existence the premise of the materialist agnosticism agnosticism disappears we are ready for a large statement and an ever developing inquiry but first it is well that we should recognize the enormous and the indispensable utility of the very brief period of rationalistic materialism through which humanity has been passing for that vast field of evidence and experience which now begins to reopen its gates to us can only be safely entered when the intellect has been severely trained severely trained to a clear austerity seized by unripe minds it lends itself to the most perilous distortions and misleading imaginations and actually in the past encrusted a real nucleus of truth with such an with such an accretion of perverting superstitions and irrationalizing dogmas that all advance in true knowledge was rendered impossible now he blames people for for mis- misappropriating these thoughts it became necessary for a time to make a clean sweep at once of the truth and its disguise in order that and its disguise in order that the road might be clear for a new departure and a surer advance the rationalistic tendency of materialism has done mankind this great service 